And welcome back to Watches Live. I was off last week in my ancestral homeland of New York, but I am back, and I am back packing heat. Today, we have all of the big three of Swiss high horology, as well as vintage watches, Chagere Lecoult, some oversized offerings from Oris and AP, as well as one of the few Ulysse Nordin freaks that I've brought onto the show to date. Let's get rolling. Okay, Mozart of I, I can see Eddie Landsberg, Matt Foster, Carlos joining us, the fat gent, self-effacing, no doubt. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for tuning in. Okay, let's get started. Right off the top, bring out my big gun. Not my biggest AP, but my big gun. This is the first Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Tourbillon that I've featured on the show. A stunning piece that came out at SIHH 2012. There's a lot going on here. First, let me get the hands out of the way because quite frankly, that's a little unworthy. Okay, 41 millimeters, blue tapisserie dial, a black polished tourbillon bridge. This is everything that a 41 millimeter stainless steel AP Royal Oak is, plus a caliber 29-24 Audemars Piguet in-house tourbillon movement. Free sprung balance with an overcoil hairspring. It beats away at 21,600, which means it's got a nice stately old school three hertz beat rate. You get a good look at the tourbillon with its black polished bridge and its black polished titanium tri-spoke cage. The nice thing about this watch is that you can enjoy it from both sides. And when you turn it over, you realize that it's just as handsome on the back. Maybe not quite as action packed, but the bridge itself is also black polished on the reverse side. And you'll note a very subtle and very tiny power reserve gauge on the case back for the 70 hour power reserve of the manual wind 2924. It's still 50 meters water resistant, so per AP, not per me, but per AP, you're okay to go swimming with this one. I'll tell you one unarguable is that the dial is fully luminescent, so you can actually use this watch as you would a standard steel sports watch. Just remember, push that crown down if you do plan on swimming and do so at your own risk. All right. Let's talk about a Royal Oak that's perhaps a little bit better suited for aquatic endeavors. Can you remember back when there were only three Terminator movies? It seems like a million years ago, but in fact, it was only 15 years. That said, remember, back when this thing came out, Arnold Schwarzenegger was more interested in politics than theatrics. This is the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Offshore T3. Back when Arnold was on the campaign trail, 1,000 of these were made, separated between the white dial, which was a 250-piece limited edition, and this anthracite dial, which I actually prefer, which was a 750-piece limited series. 48 millimeters, this is the big offshore. When you purchased this watch originally, you got the watch, a huge steamer trunk size accessory box, and all three of the then Terminator Trilogy volumes on DVD. Remember those? Well, the watch is absolutely massive. It has enormous guards over the chronograph pushers, like the pins on a grenade. And th this thing is so excessive that, frankly, I think we need a wrist shot. It is titanium, I'll give you that. That doesn't make it any less monstrous, just a little bit less hefty on the wrist. It's a massive thing even with the famed gray metal, but let's get a look at this one. Keep in mind that not only is this the rarely seen 48 millimeter case only ever used for Arnold and for Shaq, but it's also a watch that uses the original Royal Oak Offshore single point of connection for the strap. So this is the original Royal Oak Offshore strap lug profile. Note the absence of the twin intermediate plots. The only strap that you can use on this watch is the strap made for this watch. Fortunately, AP will still oblige you. Now on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, I guess there are two surprises. One, it's that it hasn't bitten my arm off, and two, it actually fits all right. It's thinner than you might suspect at 14 millimeters because it uses the old JLC base movement, so it is thinner than the in-house caliber. All the same, this was the first of the truly gonzo oversized watches of the 2000s. Back in 2003, when Arnold was still big at the box office, the T3. I can see uh, Ziggy saying, they look like brass knuckles protecting the crown, and Amro asking, another AP open worked. Yep, we've got that right 
here. Uh, question from Marco. What is the green thingy Tim's wearing? The green thingy is Tim's system frog. A Swatch System 51. And if I need to explain to you why this is called the system frog, we need to go back to boot camp. Okay. Jump into the question that was asked, what about the AP open worked? That's a great question. Back in 2010, Audemars Piguet gave us at SIHH the last of the 39 millimeter open worked Royal Oaks. This might be the prize of the whole table from an AP standpoint. Caliber 3129, this is a much higher standard of finish than you will get not just on a standard 15300, 15450, or 15400, that is your, your basic sundry automatic Royal Oak. This is a higher standard of finish than you'll see on that tourbillon. First, this is real skeletonization. This is not electro spark erosion like you'll see on, for instance, a Chrono Swiss Opus. This is the real thing. Evacuated by hand and then hand finished, the bevels inside of these bridges will make your eyes water, rounded, mirrored, with dozens of interior angles. This is as good as it gets from AP, and take note, the date has been eliminated, so the 3129 is both skeletonized and equipped without a date. 60 hours automatic winding, when you turn it over, it's still an automatic winding Royal Oak. It's based on the 3120, that's the base movement in the offshore, and the standard movement in the 15400. This was one of the last of the 39 millimeter Royal Oaks. It debuted in 2010, and by 2012, we were already seeing the jump from the 39s to the 41s. A lot of folks believe that the 39s, Gerald Genta's original intended size for the Royal Oak, still wear the best of the series. And if you want rare handcraft as well as absolute rarity in your Audemars Piguet, this is a great choice. Screw down crown, 50 meters water resistant, loomed dial, so it's a fairly usable watch. Let's get a wrist shot. I'm talking about the wearability of the 39. I think you'll agree that one suits me. Can we zoom out a little? That one suits me a little bit better than the 48 millimeter offshore. Yeah, I think that's a bit more my speed. Okay. We might come back to those watches in a moment, but since we're on a skeleton kick, let's talk about what Jajera LeCoult has to offer. Now, a few years back, around six years ago, Jajera LeCoult regaled us with the Grand Reverso Ultra Thin Skeleton blue enamel. It is a combination of a couple of things. First, note the chapter ring in blue. It is both engraved and enameled. So it's white gold that's engraved and then a translucent blue enamel is placed over it. This is not just a skeletonized set of bridges and plates. This is skeletonized and then hand engraved. I don't know how close we can get, but this watch deserves the closest we've got. So this is enameled, skeletonized, and freehand engraved. This is not done with a guilloche rose lathe. This is done the old-fashioned way, with a small chisel and a small mallet. You'll even note that the open-worked barrel features spokes in the shape of Gégère LeCoultre's interlocking JL. Let me see if I can wind it. You can watch it spring to life. You can actually see that because the barrel is open worked, you can use the spring and its relative state of coil as a sort of impromptu power reserve. Now, 50 of these were made in white gold. This is an exceptionally scarce piece. It's the same size and dimensions as the Tribute to 1931, so it is ultra thin on the wrist at under eight millimeters thick. It's broad, but it's very thin. It looks the business, and of course, because it's a reverso, I've gotta flip the case, so let me show you what awaits on the reverse side. This is the caliber 849SQ. It's been reshaped to a reverso case. You'll note that the chapter ring here is completely engraved and not enameled for easier viewing. But this is the ultra thin caliber from the 2013 Master Ultra Thin Jubilee. It's less than two millimeters thick, skeletonized and engraved. It's absolutely gorgeous. This watch is a true pleasure. Okay. Color and character, to be sure. But I've actually got a JLC on the table tonight 
that has character, yes, but it also speaks with a voice of its own. It doesn't need as much exposition from yours truly. What is it? Well, it's the Jager Lecoult Amvox R Alarm, limited edition of 150 pieces in platinum. And there it goes. Okay, so what did you just hear? Let's take a look. In 2004, JLC announced that it was pairing up with Aston Martin to create a original line, not modifications of existing watches, but an original model line dedicated to the approximately 80-year relationship between Jager Instruments and Aston Martin cars. So this is real history. Jager Instruments Tachometers, speedometers, gauges in Aston Martin road cars date back to the 1920s. In 2004, they announced a partnership, and in 2005, two different watches debuted. There was the Amvox 1, which was a 42 millimeter watch in precious metal, titanium, and steel. And then there was the Amvox R Alarm, which was 44 millimeters, not 42, and available in a 500 piece series of titanium with green accents and yellow, and a 150 piece limited series in platinum. So this is PT950 with a solid platinum case back. And as you can see, it's both individually numbered on the case back where you can see the serial number and on the flank where a separate plaque has been inset with screws, a second serial number. Take that IWC one of 150, double engraved. Now the sapphire is part of the highlight of this watch. You can see it is dramatically boxed in profile with doming. So it's both domed and boxed section. The idea is to evoke the Polaris diving alarm of the 60s. The original Polaris made from the prototype stage in 1963 towards the first iteration of production models in 65, and finally the definitive model in 68, used an identical case profile. That one used a plexiglass, this one used a sapphire, but the lugs, the case flank, even the case back, almost identical from the Polaris to the Amvox Oral Alarm. You will note the Polaris has 16 perforations on the back, the Amvox has 14. But even the dial draws on the Polaris. The font used for the numerals, the hands, the Calypso style, were used on a small number of Polaris 68s that I believe shipped to the Italian market. But you can also see the Aston Martin influences as the lower part of the dial is uncalibrated, just like a tachometer or a speedometer. And moreover, the font used for the numerals is stepped in intermediate sizes, just like you would find on a speedometer or a tachometer. You'll also note that there is a bi-directional internal rotating bezel that you can line up with the minute hand for impromptu timing. Now it's not a dive watch, but it's an awfully versatile all-around sportster. 44 millimeters, but at 49 millimeters lug to lug, you can find that this one actually wears well on a small wrist. I'm a big fan. And I have to say that this one's a little bit less extravagant than the green, the British Racing Green Titanium model. But if you're wondering what claim to fame this watch might have, besides being the more attractive of the two, both of the Amvox or alarms are known as the Lou Reed because the late Lou Reed actually wore one of his own. Okay. Now let's go way off the beaten path here. I promised you AP, Vacheron, and Paddock. I've shown you Jager Lecoult, but I want to point the camera and draw attention towards a brand that really deserves more praise and attention than it gets, and Arnold and & Son is that brand. Revived in the 1990s, it refers to a classical era British watchmaker, but for practical purposes, it is the brand associated with the integrated manufacturer La Joux Pere. Now, this is the Arnold & Son UTTE, which is Ultra Thin Tourbillon Escapement. What is it? Well, it's exactly what it claims to be. It's as thin as a Royal Oak Jumbo at 8.3 millimeters thick, 42 millimeters in diameter. It has a beautiful metallic grained dial. And what really sets it apart, in addition to the flying tourbillon and that signature dial, is the fact that this watch is one of the precious few you'll ever encounter that is made of palladium. Yes, palladium, PD, not PT. It is 95% pure, and you'll note 
not just the case, but also the pin buckle. You might even be able to see this one is stamped PD950, a very unusual application of a precious metal that is hallmarked like gold and platinum, but hardly ever seen. Now, what you'll note is that there are multiple metallic finishes on the dial side, and when you turn the watch over, the caliber Arnold & Son 8200 manual wind with an 80-hour power reserve is entirely hand-finished. You can see the richly textured Cote de Genève, light on one side, dark on the opposite, laid down with an abrasive wheel, not a stamp. You'll also note when I turn it flush to the camera that the edges of the bridges as well as the jewel countersinks light up and gleam. The true hand-finished, rounded, mirrored anglage. A beautiful watch, and one that comes from a fully integrated manufacturer with total pedigree in that it creates every single part of the watch except for a few minor parts like shock protection and stones. They have money from Citizen Watch of Japan to build and service these watches forever, so you get the pleasure of an independent manufacturer with the money of a super major group behind it to stay extant and solvent. The best of both worlds, 42 millimeters in palladium. We'll do a wrist shot with this one. It is ultra thin. I can't overemphasize, you lose some of the effect when I just show it in space. It is super slim, one of the thinnest tourbillon regulators you'll find. The movement itself is less than five millimeters thick. Absolutely gorgeous. Arnold and Son UTTE. Also, while that watch typically retails above $60,000, you can get it pre-owned for under twenty-five. dollars That's the miracle of pre-owned. But the other miracle of pre-owned is that you see just about everything in one place. Uh, quickly, calling out to my audience, I can see Marco um, and what is Eric saying? Eric is saying, Tim, your advice to have a full deployment to prevent drops is never more applicable than this piece right here. He's talking about the Arnold and Son. I would put that on a deployant. I would order an Arnold and Son deployant with some of the money I saved by buying it used. And I can also see that uh, Moro is saying 24K sounds even feasible. It's not that crazy. A lot of folks will go out and they'll buy a Boston Whaler or they'll buy a Harley Davidson factory custom or they'll buy themselves a Ducati Panigale and they'll wind up spending more money on the purchase than they would on the watch. And in a couple of years, it's worth close to nothing, and you've got the costs of maintenance, tires, insurance. A pre-owned watch is a great store of value that's a hell of a lot more fun than treasuries. Okay, jumping back, I can see right here, um, Matt Foster asking, what is the ask on that? Now you know, Don Gizzle from Germany saying, Arnold and Son, he's a fan of the CTB and thinking of buying one. You need to check out my review of the CTB on Watchbox Reviews. It's the double step chronograph that is both central second sweep and a, it's actually central seconds deadbeat and a chronograph sweep seconds hand. It looks spectacular. It's probably the second most spectacular chronograph after what I'm about to show you. Back in 2007, can't believe it's 11 years ago already. JLC wowed the industry and actually wound up winning Time Zone Watch of the Year with the original yellow gold dual met chronograph. Now they made it in the most traditional of golds with an eggshell dial that has a wonderful pebbly grain to it. The case is 42 millimeters, and this original yellow gold series featured a 300 piece limited edition that was numbered on both the dial side as well as on the case back. And this is that for which you pay. Caliber 380, entirely hand finished. It's actually more like a longa than a Chagere Le Coult. Two main spring barrels. When you wind both with a single crown, one ratchets while the other winds. Now two power trains. When you activate the chronograph, and you can see the chronograph is separated from the civil time, you actually wind up with nine hands and a scrolling minutes disc on this dial, but you have both seconds at center as well as parallel time displays and parallel drivetrains. Two mainsprings, two drivetrains, the only point where they meet is at the escapement, with one escapement acting as a traffic cop, stopping one, starting the other, and then alternating back. It is a mono-pusher chronograph with a glorious column wheel that allows you to see all of the levers and horns and the column wheel in action, as well as the showmanship for your friends when you reset the mechanism. 
absolutely spectacular. Why do all this? Two reasons. One, it looks awesome. Two, by having separate power reserves and drivetrains, you can activate the chronograph and you can run it concurrently with the time of day without reducing the power reserve so it runs just as long with the chrono on 50 hours and because you double the power when you double the drain there's no loss of amplitude in the balance so it fulfills two goals of looking great and giving you absolute chronometer grade precision even with the chronograph engaged and no loss of power reserve. For traditionalists though the watch originally known as the Vacheron Constantin, patrimony traditional chronograph. Today, it's the traditionnel, and it's best known as the reference, which is unchanging, 47192. Now, the watch you see here is 42 millimeters and beautifully executed with the old school Le Mans 2310 Abouch. Now, why is this important? Simple. It's beautiful. This is the movement that as the Omega Caliber 321 went to the moon. As the CH27, it went in the Patek Philippe 5070. It's been seen on a variety of high-end chronographs from manufacturers as far-flung as Roger Dubuis of Geneva and Breguet of Le Sentier. It's big, it's bold, it's gorgeous, and the nice thing about a manual wind column wheel lateral clutch chronograph, if we can keep that in focus, is you lose absolutely none of the details of the engagement and disengagement of the clutch and the reset and recentering of the hammers on the heart cams at center. Big, beautiful, with a stately 18,000 beat balance. Look at the balance. It's almost one-third the diameter of the movement. That's old school. You want more old school? You got it. Look right here underneath my finger, stretched from the balance cock to the opposite bridge. There's a small gold wire. That is a hooking guard. So the overcoil hairspring, if it gets shocked, can't accidentally double up on its own coils or get hooked on the regulator. That is old school. You'll see that on Rolex Daytona Val 72s from the 1960s. Beautifully finished, immaculately executed. This watch is gorgeous and a throwback, a living legend, the 49172. Wrist shot, absolutely. By the way, I know some of you are wondering, white gold, opaline, frosted dial, beautiful watch, wears well on any wrist with any skin tone, a good versatile size to modern, not undersized, but not oversized either. At 42, this is what a modern men's dress chronograph should be. It's also what a Vacheron should be. And as the brand gathers itself and recovers, I hope to see more like that. Okay. Let's go way afield now. Let's, let's talk about something that is definitively not high horology, but on the basis of equipment, fit, finish, and price, this is luxury horology. I define luxury horology as a watch that has a permanent secondary market, so someone will pay something for it pre-owned, and can be serviced indefinitely by traditional watchmakers. On that basis, let's face it, if you pay a few thousand dollars for a watch, you deserve to wear that watch for life. Oris gives you that. Is this a bit bombastic? Yes. Is it a more sensible 48 than the Audemars Piguet? You better believe it. These are both 48 millimeter watches. You can already see the Audemars Piguet is designed to look huge, whereas the Oris has a purposeful size about it. Why? Because this is a diving chronograph and a depth gauge. In 2015, Oris took the Aquas depth gauge and added a chronograph. So stainless steel, 48 millimeters, there's a little aperture just underneath 12 o'clock, and you can see that there is then a tube that runs the circumference of the crystal, and that tube allows the interaction of water pressure and air pressure to form a meniscus. And if you see the yellow numbers around the periphery of the dial, the meniscus will move around the dial as you dive and it will actually read up to 100 meters your current depth. It's an ingenious solution that gives you a functional depth gauge on a watch that costs thousands or tens of thousands less than equivalent complications from IWC, Panerai, and Jaguar LeCoult. Moreover, you get an automatic chronograph with a 48-hour power reserve. It's a Salida SW500, basically a Val 772 
or 7750, I should say. Um, the watch features a conversion factor case back, feet to meters, for those of you who need to convert Imperial to SI, and the, even the bezel is deluxe and punches above its weight. It's got a it's got a solid detent to it, and you'll note it is a ceramic insert rather than anodized aluminum or ADLC. That's the right way to do things. Remember, Oris makes watches to be worn by human beings, and though this watch is 48 millimeters, on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, it wears easily. You want more, you got it. Oris includes strap changing tools, spare retaining bars for the strap, and an accessory bracelet with a clasp when you buy this watch. All of that comes in a Pelican case, and if you agree with me that this isn't quite high horology, it's definitely luxury, especially with that level of spec. You want more? Well, Oris will oblige you. I've often complained about cut straps. Now, Oris does give you the option of cutting this strap. As you can see, there are striations where you can cut, but you can also make conventional adjustments on the fly because inside its deployment clasp is a conventional pin. So you can cut it and you can still make adjustments, but it gets better because not only do you have a minderless system that eliminates strap minder loops, but you have an incremental adjustment built into the clasp that allows you to add or subtract length as you see fit. You can actually make micro adjustments without taking the bracelet or the strap off your wrist. And that's excellent because it prevents you from dropping the watch if you are in a marine environment. You don't have to take it off and resize. You can just make an adjustment in the clasp without ever pulling it off your wrist. Smart. Oris, the watch isn't quite my style or to my taste, but you know what? The quality is unimpeachable and so is the value. Oris of Holstein, family owned watch brand. Okay. Uh, Ranger Joe saying, comes with a Pelican case, sold. Comes with a Pelican case, strap changing tools, an accessory bracelet with a clasp, and spare bars, plus tons of literature and photographs to tell you all about what you just bought. All right. I'm saving two of the best for last. Let's talk Ulysse Norden. A brand maybe not the recipient of enough love on this show. And on this channel generally, I'm going to try to feature more UN in the near future because I love the brand authentically. And this watch, which debuted in 2014, the Blue Cruiser, was part of the inaugural family of water-resistant freaks. That's right. Note there is no aperture in the center of the crystal. Unlike every freak made from 2001 to 2013, this one actually doesn't have a hole in its crystal as the upper mounting point for the staff of the carousel, so it has 30 meters water resistant rating. Not a big deal? Okay, let's talk about what is a big deal. When the Freak came out in 2001, it did three things. It gave us a direct impulse escapement, it gave us a silicon escapement, and it gave us a carousel that acts as the indicator of time. So you could see, this is the, this is the hour hand, the carousel acts as the minute hand. The difference between a carousel and a tourbillon is that with a carousel, there are two separate powertrains, one that operates the escapement and one that drives the carriage. So it does spin around the dial in 60 minute cycles, but if you were to stop it or, or change its direction, it would not stop the escapement or damage the carousel. Bonnet Bonnickson actually invented the carousel in the late 19th century as a more durable version of the tourbillon, and this is a perfect application. Now, I'll also mention that one of the secrets of every freak after the first one is that there is a small cover that you lift at 6 o'clock and push down. You lift in order to change the time. Remember I said that you could move the carousel without affecting the escapement? Well, when you're setting the time on the freak, you do exactly that. You'll note the carousel indicates the minute, and that giant anchor-shaped hour hand moves in sync. You lock down this little tab when you're done. Now you wind it using the case back. You wind with the case back, and it has a seven day power reserve. So if this is an occasional watch for you, and at 45 millimeters, big blue and white gold, it might be an occasional watch for you, you don't have to worry about winding it more than once a week when you throw this bad boy on for the weekend. Silicon dual impulse escapement with silicon escape wheels, silicon hairspring, free sprung balance, beating way at 28.8. This is modern technology the way no one else does it. Ulysse Nordin giving you both avant-garde tech 
all of it made in-house. They make their own silicon, and they have since 2006, giving you avant-garde tech with avant-garde style. Let's put it on the wrist. This is another watch with a judiciously chosen deployant clasp. So that's 45, and you know what guys? 16 centimeter wrist, smallish wrist. I have no problem wearing this. If we zoom out a little bit, you can even get a sense of how it looks in proportion to the rest of my arm. You could absolutely wear this on a wrist as small as 15 centimeters. This is the kind of watch to buy pre-owned. Not a great store of value new, but you're not gonna lose pre-owned, and you'll have the only one in the office, guaranteed. When everyone else is ripping out the Royal Oak Offshores, the Hublot Big Bangs, trying to make a statement with the Deep Sea, you're gonna have the one watch that no one can miss and no one can identify. And if that sounds cool to you, you're a dyed-in-the-wool watch nerd. And finally, I always say, I'd like to begin and end with the alpha and the omega of watches. Unfortunately, there's no alpha, but I've got an omega. So I may as well talk about my omega and Rolex, the last word in watches. Okay, by the way, the last point debatable. This is the coolest watch on the table. I take back everything I said before, this is an early 1970s Omega Flight Master. It's got a caliber 910 based on the 861, but it does cool stuff that a normal moon watch doesn't. First, back when the Rolex GMT didn't have a real second time zone, this watch gave you an independently settable second time zone. It also gave you an internal rotating bi-directional bezel, a sealed crystal that's actually seated and then bonded in place. This was the era of mineral crystal. You can see this one's beautifully intact. The creases as well as the finish of this flight Master are immaculate, and you'll note every crown is color-coded to match its function. You see the orange? That corresponds to the orange chronograph hands, so you can use those orange pushers to start, stop, and reset the chronograph. Blue? Well, that crown controls the second time zone, which features a blue hand. And of course, black, that controls the black of the internal rotating bezel. Immaculate dial, no patina. There is tritium fade, but there's no oxidation, no water damage, no degradation. All those things that vintage dealers try to sell as character and charm, I'm happy to say this watch is free of all of them. Made briefly in the early 70s and never as popular as the Omega Moon Watch or the Mark series, the Flightmaster was a landmark pilot's watch. 52 millimeters lug to lug, 43 and a half from side to side. This was the most advanced pilot watch you could buy in 1969. And this example still has its original Omega 1159 bracelet and 155 end links. You can even see this case is so untouched that the original Flightmaster Douglas DC-8 logo, a shallow engraving, is still visible on the case back. All that and it has its correct vintage Omega logo crown. This one is the full package. And frankly, I would love to end on that note, but I've got two watches that I want to share. First and quickly, Rolex. We're not going to end with Rolex because it's not the last word in watches. I respect the brand. I don't love it. Okay. Blue lacquer dial. Blue Cerachrom bezel, absolutely blinged out. This isn't the Smurf so much as the Papa Smurf. I love when you call me Big Papa, and this watch is right up your alley if you like to style on Miami Beach or LA's Sunset Strip. This is a watch that has color, character, presence, pedigree, and frankly, despite the image, and the image is hard to miss, this is a substantial watch. A gold Rolex on a full bracelet today with solid end links, solid center links, the full milled out clasp. It feels like a platinum Rolex from years past, back when things were stamped and hollow. It has incredible mass. These days, the dial is actually a metallic blue. I prefer the gloss blue. It's a better match for the bezel. It's more coherent. And finally, remember, this is a Submariner, so you're not getting Easy Link. You're getting Glide Lock. 20 millimeters of adjustment inside the clasp in 2 millimeter increments. Highly sizable, highly stylish. This is one to wear while you're vacationing in far-flung locations where people aren't afraid to let it hang out. French or Italian Riviera, this watch is so there. 
and we're going to wrap with what might be the coolest Patek Philippe Nautilus of the 2000s. With all due respect to the 3712, the one year, the three year and rarely seen yellow gold 5711J, this was the coolest and probably the least common mainstream Patek Nautilus of the era. This is the Nautilus 5800. It was announced as part of the 30th anniversary collection in 2006. It was made for one year spanning two model years. From 2007 to 2008, it was out of the catalog and gone by 2009. This is a 35 millimeter Nautilus that is everything its big brother 5711 is, except for one thing the 5711 is not. This one features a monoblock case. That's right, the sapphire is inserted over the Geneva Hallmark caliber 330. The sapphire is inserted and pressed in. You're not looking at a screwed in case back. This is a monoblock like the original 1976 Gerald Gent patent, which means it is a front component that is then fixed via the winglets to a solid monoblock case back. Original Nautilus 3700 construction in the 5800 midsize. And though the original 3800 midsize Nautilus was made from 1981 to about early 2006, this watch was effectively a one year wonder. See it on the wrist, remember, this watch looks every inch the Nautilus that it is, and in terms of construction, it's more authentic to Gerald Genta's vision than the Jumbo 5711 of today. Plus, on a wrist as small as 13 centimeters, this watch looks the business. It's got the stance, it's got the size. Don't let the midsize deceive you. This is a purebred Nautilus and one I would easily choose over the far more common 5711. You want more convincing? Not only is this monoblock, not only is this still Geneva seal, but take a quick gander at this bracelet. That's right, the midsize has screws, not pins and sleeves. 5711, you just got served. Guys, thank you so much to all who joined. I really appreciate your participation. I always read your comments after the fact. So even if I didn't respond in real time, I'm going to go back and I'm going to read everything you wrote because I appreciate what you guys do. You give me the best job in the world. Thanks to you. Thanks to the crew. This has been Watches Live. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on. <laughs>